I want to introduce our uh, trainer, facilitator, teacher, guide for this evening. Um, I was actually thinking about, I don't remember exactly when I met you, Zan, or how we met. Like, we're in a lot of shared space and a lot of shared community. And it just feels like, you know, one of those things that we've been circling each other for some time and trying to find some way to connect. And it's been really fun over the last uh, little while here to have an opportunity to sit on a virtual panel with you. Uh, perhaps uh, I'll, I'll share that link in the follow-up email as well. Zan and I were part of a, a panel with the Faith Matters Network a little while ago on how direct action can be healing. Um, I also used to be on the board of the One Life Institute, which Zan is the executive director of. Um, and so, you know, we've had a couple of opportunities to connect and it's always felt like very immediately, like, oh, we're kindred spirits and we need to find ways to collaborate more. And really excited to be able to host you on this call and to feel like we're, we're uh, finding more and more opportunities to deepen in our relationship and our collaboration. So um, I'll just read a, a few things from her official bio. Zan West considers herself a street theologian, a messy mystic, radical ritual holder, and a spiritual trauma healer. She is mostly a black queer femme troublemaker. She's the executive director of the One Life Institute, uh, and prior to joining the One Life Institute, Zan was the director of student ministry at Trinity United Methodist Church, where she enjoyed inspiring resilience, preaching liberation, and decolonizing scripture. Before that, she worked in multimedia, sound production, and journalism. She holds a certificate of spirituality and social change from the Pacific School of Religion. She was a 2016 Black Theology and Leadership Institute Fellow at Princeton Theological Seminary. In 2017, she facilitated a workshop on liturgical direct action for the Millennial Leadership Program at Union Theological Seminary. There's lots more that could be said about her, but uh, with that, I will turn the mic over to you. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this evening's teachings. So thank you so much for joining us, Sam. Thanks so much, Kazu. Um, the feeling is absolutely mutual. Um, I think I told you not that long ago, um, that I have a like a caveat that is mostly reserved for like the elder black women in my community that I'm unable to say no to them. And you've been grandmothered into that cause. I am <laughs> highly unable <laughs> to say uh, no to you and the brilliance that um, comes from your thinking in your community. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I remember you telling me that we are both, um, we're part of the, <laughs> I'm going to date us, forgive me, um, the World Trade, uh, the protest against the World Trade Centers um, in the late 90s, um, which I just don't know that many people that were part of that movement iteration. So um, I'm grateful to share that with you. Yeah. Um, so to give you guys um, a little bit of a roadmap of where I want to go with you tonight, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about my experience doing direct action. Um, and then we're going to really get into the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of um, strategy around how to plan a direct action. We're going to do some small group time together um, and have you guys actually spend a very short period of time um, thinking about what it could be like to plan action. And then towards the end of, of our time together, um, we're going to talk about healing and self-care um, and how to create movements that are more about healing and less about trauma or even like thinking about um, how we experience those things in movement community together. Um, so to get started, um, so you've heard um, some things about me. I am born and raised in Oakland, California. Um, I grew up around a lot of very radical community. Um, I'm what's known in some communities as a panther cub. I grew up um, learning a lot of movement from um, a lot of folks that had been involved in um, the Black Panthers and other um, Black prison movements at the time. And um, so that's where a lot of my grounding and movement came from. I started being involved in direct action. Um, for those of you who have been in Oakland for a long time, uh, when I was growing up, once again, dating myself, <laughs> um, when I was growing up, 
Lake Merritt in Oakland was the place where uh, most of the Black youth in Oakland congregated. And um, in the late to mid 90s, uh, when I was in high school, they instituted what are called no cruising laws um, to try and criminalize the Black youth that hung out at Lake Merritt. And so that's when I very first became involved in direct action and doing uh, street blockades and all kinds of things against um, the criminalization of youth in Oakland. Um, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, then I became very involved in many of the movements against um, globalization and the World Trade Organization. Um, I've been involved in a lot of direct action around the movement for Black Lives. Um, maybe about five or six years ago, you may have heard about a crew of folks called the Black Brunch Crew. <laughs> um, that was my squad. <laughs> we used to go uh, in places where people were eating brunch and we would name, read the names of people who had been murdered by the police. Um, so I say all of this to say I've been involved in um, several different iterations of direct action and movement throughout my life. Um, they've all been very different, uh, had their pros and cons, but um, I think it's helpful for you all to sort of know the lens um, that I look through. Uh, so um, what is important about this, um, if you read the blurb when you were registering, um, you saw a little bit of conversation sort of around, um, sometimes there's this popular idea that people just get really angry and take to the street and shut something down. And I have been involved in those kind of um, actions, to be honest. That is sometimes how actions happen. Um, especially after Mike Brown, I remember there were a number of nights where people were in the streets of Oakland and someone would say, let's take the freeway and people would just take the freeway. And that is a total um, valid form of protest and an important form of direct action. Um, and yet, throughout time, throughout movement history, we have had these um, folks, such as um, what we said in the blurb around um, this narrative of Rosa Parks having sat on the bus start, uh, to start the Montgomery bus boycott because she was tired. Um, I used to teach eighth grade in Oakland, and the history books in Oakland um, that my kids were reading said uh, Rosa Parks didn't get up because she was tired. Um, and so I had to tell my students, oh, oh no kids, um, Rosa Parks was sick and tired. <laughs> um, and she was sick and tired, so she became a highly skilled direct action organizer. Um, and so I think it's really important to live into that narrative of the more strategic, uh, the more educated, and really the more we can learn um, from the things we've done really well and the things that maybe have been a little bit challenging the more we can really uh, revisit our past uh, and learn from those things, I think the better that our direct actions get. So that is the framework of why I really love teaching direct action trainings and why I'm here with all of you, because I think the more um, we really dig into the idea that people have done this before and have really um, come up with well thought out ideas and tactics around how to do direct action. But I do want to say this is in no way an exhaustive study. It's not like if you don't do it this way, you're not really doing direct action or there is only one way to do direct action. None of that is true. Um, this is a number of different things that I've put together through the training that I've been given and the things that I've learned real quick and dirty on the fly. Um, and I am totally open. I know there's a lot of folks on this call who may or may not have direct action training or experience, um, but I am totally open to be in conversation about um, how some of these things may or may not be utilized or could be adapted um, to fit different um, situations and different contexts. Um, so, what is direct action? So um, I really like to uplift the uh, quote of um, the ancestor Bayard Rustin, who says, um, our power is in our ability to make things unworkable. And to me, that's really the underlying definition of 
direct action is a real challenge to the status quo that gets up under um, a lot of times uh, direct action is targeting things that really have been normalized in our society. Right. So a good example of that would be what I was telling you about our crew that did the black brunches. There's this normalization of um, two counter things. Right. There's this normalization of that certain people in our society have leisure time and expendable income to sit in a restaurant um, on a you know weekend morning or whatever and eat brunch. And I love brunch. We're not mad at brunch, <laughs> but um, not everybody has access, um, has the same access to um, that type of leisure. And so that was part of what we were targeting, but then also what we were normalizing or what we were targeting um, was the normalization of black grief being private, right? So many of us, when, um, when we witness horrible black death um, on this communal landscape that's on social media and on our face and this constant input. Um, a lot of times, many of us, we go to work and there's no conversation about our grief. Um, we're in different communities um, where there's no conversation about our grief. And so there's this expectation for Black folks to grieve in their homes um, and then come out into the world and perform and serve. And so we were challenging those um, competing narratives and norms and saying, um, we can enter into these brunch places and if you don't wanna confront the reality of our grief and the people that are being buried um, while you're eating pancakes, um, then we will bring it directly to your brunch. Um, so I hope that makes sense um, to folks in terms of how I'm talking about the idea of um, approaching things that have been highly normalized by our society um, and making them unworkable, right? Um, certainly folks were still able to eat their pancakes, but there's a certain unworkableness um, to leisure time when people are reading out the names of their dead. Um, do folks have questions um, or comments around that and the idea of direct action being the power to make things unworkable. Sweet. Um, and as we go forward, please feel free. Um, I cannot see all the raised hands, but Kazu can. So please feel free to either use the raise hand function um, or to write questions and comments in the chat box. And there actually is a hand from Courtney, if you'd like to. Oh, yes, please. So Courtney, Alex, go ahead. And well, I, I, at first, the um, I didn't catch the name of the ancestor you quoted, um, but the ability to make things unworkable, unworkable was the word that I missed. Um, but it sounds like unworkable might also be tied with uncomfortable. Because um, I, was, I was thinking about the idea of the brunch where it seems like it would make everybody uncomfortable, which to me is also, I guess, part of um, challenging white supremacy is also around um, this quality of introducing discomfort where there has previously been comfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's totally true. I don't know if discomfort is the uh, motivation of every action, but it certainly can be. Um, and people were made very uncomfortable by that action. And a lot of people uh, called the police on us, which was like, uh, clearly you don't understand <laughs> the point of what it is that we're doing. Um, but yes, um, discomfort because of um, exactly what I think you're uplifting, that um, comfort is something that is accessible for just certain folks, right? And so creating an underlying discomfort um, really challenges the norm of who has access to comfort and who doesn't. So I appreciate you uplifting that. Um, the other thing I really love about direct action is that it really um, restores our ability to be self-determined. Um, a lot of times I experience this thing in the way that people, and I am not here to have a debate about voting or tell anyone to vote or not vote, um, but a lot of times when I hear people talk about voting, there's this sort of dissociation thing that happens where it's like, I am gonna vote for this person who's gonna do the thing that's outside of me 
And what I love about direct action is it's really about reclaiming your power and saying, no, um, the power, I have this embodied power um, to influence. And especially a lot of direct action, um, like the one that I just named, is really um, often geared at like a cultural um, reshaping. Uh, and so I really like the power of direct action to give us the ability to reclaim our self-determination. Um, the other thing about direct action um, that I want to uplift, part of what I was just saying about electoral politics, I think that direct action works the very best when it's part of a larger campaign. Um, and especially when it's part of a lar larger campaign that has a diversity of tactics. Right. Um, and so, for instance, sometimes um, if we look at like the civil rights movement, right, um, you look at people who were doing voter registration drives and um, the Montgomery bus boycott, which, you know, boycotting is a form of direct action um, and people who were speaking in churches, right, like all these different concerted efforts and diversity of tactics. Um, and even um, I've read some reading from Martin Luther King, who's, you know, talked about how um, even though he wasn't necessarily always associated with the direct action, there was a way in which the direct action helped him um, push for more things um, because of the diversity of tactics of the civil rights movement. Um, and so I think that's really important. Um, to think about the ways that we can work together, even if our approaches are not always the same. And then if you'd um, like to put another hand up. Yes, please. So, uh, Tui, go ahead and I see your hand. Great. Hi, thank you for being here and sharing your experience. Um, you've answered part of that question in terms of um, embedding direct action um, into a larger framework of, you know, what we're accomplishing. And I think one of my um, questions is, when you're doing a direct action, it seems like there is um, a couple of sides there. And in, in making people or making things unworkable or, or things uncomfortable, what is the follow on to that? Like, what is the expected, um, because you're there, you obviously have a message and there is some action that, and energy that is happening between the different sides to create this discomfort, to create this awakening, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have this energy there and then what? Like what is the follow on to um, like, it, it feels almost empty to then just leave to like have your message there and then and then things dissipate and people go on with their brunch you know mm -hmm. or um, the cops are called and um the folks are taken away and people are like great they're taken away i can go on with my brunch like what what is the expected um follow-on after after such actions are taking place and maybe there isn't mm -hmm. and maybe the formula to sometimes there's a follow on, sometimes there's not, but you know, is there a formula? And if so, if you could share a little bit of that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally good question. Um, so I think that a little bit later, we're gonna get into a conversation about messaging. And I think a lot of it is in the messaging. And so I would really appreciate if you would actually ask that question again, if you don't feel like it's answered in the part that we talk about messaging. Um, but I, I hear you, I've been involved in a number of actions where when I talk about why I did it and then the experience of the people um, who saw it, it's often very different. And I think sometimes the gap can really be in the way that we talk about it, right? So, um, and this is not, I'm in, in nothing that I talk about in my disparaging, you know, mine or anybody else's work. Um, but maybe about five years ago, some of you um, may remember when black activists shut down the Bay Bridge. Uh, I remember my boss was caught in that traffic 
And the next day at work, he was like, you know, I support Black lives and I'm really unclear on how it took me, how it taking me four and a half hours to get home to my kids did something for Black lives, right? Um, And what I had to own was like, oh, that's a failure in our messaging, right? Um, So hopefully um, that will kind of get at, does that feel like um, what you're asking? Yeah, I think I think you're right. Part of it is messaging because that gets lost when there's a big group. And of course, so many people, like you said, are internalizing what's happening to themselves very differently and taking on their own experiences into what's going on. Like he wants to get home to his to his family and is taking four hours. So he shuts down, you know, all that the larger picture of Black lives and um, what's happening to the Black community. But uh, I guess that's where people are getting confused with the actions that are being taken. And I think that people are in agreement with what is going on in the world in terms of the environment, um, in terms of the way our capitalism is, is, you know, really affecting the poverty and um, the racism in our society, but then what, you know? And I think that becomes a harder thing to, um, to have. How do, we, how, how do we further those conversations? How do we further that messaging um, to, to the groups that we're targeting. You know what I mean? It's, um, I don't know if I'm posing the question correctly, but it seems like there's this huge uh, action happening, this huge protest. It's amazing, it's wonderful, um, depending on what side you're on. And then, you know, pe- people who are feeling uncomfortable are left with this discomfort, right? They go back and they talk about it in one of two ways. like wow, that was really powerful and I see what they're saying, or how did being stuck on the Bay Bridge for four hours get your messaging across? You know, so then what? Like, where does that person, where does that other side, and maybe there's no control for the other side of where they should go, but I guess maybe that's the other side of the equation in, um, that's missing is how do we further that conversation with these people that that we're actually trying to make aware. I don't know, I'm sorry, I may not. No, I, I think there's a lot there. Um, I think the other piece that you're bringing up, or it, I think I'm in a very tactical mind frame right now, but what it's bringing up to me is also questions around who is our audience, mm-hmm. right? Um, because potentially everyone on the Bay Bridge is not our audience, right? Is our audience, the other Black people who we want to know that we care about their lives? Um, Is our audience commuters that we want to stop polluting the air? Um, Is our audience Trump supporters, right? And all of those messages to those different audiences would look very Mm -hmm. different. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think there's this way, as you're talking, what I'm thinking is like the idea of or my understanding of the idea of direct action is sort of to force the conversation and rip it open, right? Because in our society, actually the truth is, I don't know about you guys, but I can't watch these debates because I'm like, y'all aren't talking about nothing. Like nobody's talking about anything. (laughs) Nothing that matters to me, right? And so it's like this way that the things that really matter in society to me are so deeply normalized that they're not even part of the conversation anymore. And so the role of direct action is to like rip it open and be like, you thought you were on your way home, um, but we're going to force this conversation. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, how well or not we do that (laughs) is on us, you know, but I think the idea really is about forcing conversations that aren't being had. Um, And there's all types of different direct actions, but the overwhelming majority of the ones that I've been involved in, um, that's sort of the underlying motivation. 
And um, maybe as we go through planning the direct action, we can sort of loop back and see if we're, we're getting at what it is that you're wondering. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. Are there more questions? Sweet. Um, so the other really um, important thing about direct action for me is I think it really is a powerful tool for folks who are in whatever minority identity, right? Um, it, for like uh, we see in Movement for Black Lives. For Black folks who are not necessarily the majority of the population, and so then therefore the conversation has to be um, if we're looking at electoral politics, then we have to see how many Black people we can get to agree that Black people don't deserve to be killed by the police. But this is like a way that people who are in the minority can actually force the conversation without having to be involved in like legislation or running candidates. It's really a way that a very small group of folks um, can really create a lot of shift. Uh, and that's what I really like about it. Um, so let's talk about some forms of direct action. And once again, definitely not an exhaustive list, um, but I am going to attempt to share my screen. So, Can you guys see my screen? Not yet. Okay. We can see it now. Okay. Sweet. So here are a couple of the most well-known kinds of direct action. Wheat pasting, stenciling, marching in the street or blockades um, or like the freeway takeovers that I was talking about a little while ago. Um, blocking traffic, making a lot of noise. Um, some of you may remember about five years ago, um, the same Black Brunch crew we did an action called Wake Your Mayor Up and on um, Martin Luther King, the, the day that's normally celebrated as the holiday for MLK, we woke the mayor of Oakland up at 5 a.m. <laughs> we made a lot of noise in her neighborhood. So that's like an example of a noise action. Um, property redecoration is always a lot of fun. Um, building or office takeover, squatting. Um, I have been involved in some of those actions of like sitting in a mayor's office, uh, harassing public figures, and sometimes we get arrested to make a political point. And sometimes those are, there are multiple ones of those that we do at the same time. There are certainly a lot more. Um, people have gotten very creative around some of these things, but this is just um, a sort of quick list of some most common direct actions. Um, here is some of the functions of direct action. Uh, direct action is often used as an announcement or an alarm. And that's sort of what we were talking about, about um, forcing a conversation. Um, oftentimes these announcements or alarms are followed with some amount of demands. Uh, reinforcement, that's like we were talking about when it's involved within a campaign that uh, perhaps you're asking people to vote for something or support a certain kind of legislation, but now this is like our ad campaign <laughs> uh, is the direct action. Um, punctuation is a similar thing. Um, escalation, sometimes it's we had this set of demands, we met with the city council, we talked about it. Y'all said you're not going to meet our demands. Now we're escalating. 
And sometimes, um, and actually I really love this um, as a tactic for direct action. As I was giving the example about um, folks on the Bay Bridge, um, it was like, what if our goal is building morale amongst other black folks to let them know um, that there are black folks who are tired and gonna fight for their lives. Um, and that, that is a really important one. Um, I can say definitely during a lot of the Black Brunch actions we did, there were an, a lot, a lot, a lot of Black folks from all over the country that were saying, um, this is absolutely supporting my mor morale um, as a Black person, that there are some folks who are just, you know, not going to take it anymore. Uh, do folks have any questions, comments, concerns about any of that before we were about to move on to the section around um, really getting into the tactics of planning a direct action. I, yeah, I have a question. So like in a case where it's about building morale or something, mm -hmm. In fact, this came up with a friend of mine who was doing this Asian type of rally thing. Um, and then maybe you talked about it. I was, I came on the call late, but w given that if the action is not just internal, if it involves other people, right? Like the general public or like the case of the freeway shutdown, how do you manage those very, you know, the fact that the intention is for a certain community, yet there's all these other people who aren't part of that community. Or, you know what I mean? Or do you want to choose an action that really only involves the community that it's intended for versus including all these other people, whether they're bystanders or whatever? And I'm just, I, yeah, and I'm partly asking that because I have to be honest, I have this perception. I think so often I see or hear about quote unquote actions and I'm not correlating what, like what is that gonna lead? Kind of like the example that you are saying about your boss being four hours late seeing their child. So I would love to just kind of feel a little more tighter about some of those elements there. Yeah, hopefully it seems a little bit to me like maybe this question is also somewhat related to audience in the sense of when we plan who our audience is going to be, who this action is for, how well do we know our audience, right? Um, and so, and this is not accurate, but let's just say um, if the Bay Bridge shutdown was to build morale amongst other Black folks in the Bay Area, um, would that target have made sense? Is that where the majority of Black mm -hmm. folks in the Bay Area are at 5 p.m.? Probably not. Um, and so part of it, I think, is also mm -hmm. about how well do you know the audience that you're trying to be in conversation with? And who are they? Where are they? How do they talk? All of these things. Um, is, does that feel helpful? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing that there's some strategy around that. Um, I'm also wondering though, like some of the items that you listed, would that like create defensiveness or res res resentment? You know what I mean? Like trigger, trigger those, like, I mean, I'm sorry, but like, I don't think most people want their property reconfigured, for example. So I'm a little bit trying to reconcile these strategies with what I understand nonviolence to be. I'm not saying that I'm averse to those strategies, but I'm noticing my body is averse to those strategies because I'm having a hard time reconciling my image of those strategies and what I think that would elicit in the recipient and I'm imagining it wouldn't elicit openness, which I think would be the pathway towards movements being furthered. So I'm really wanting to connect these dots in a very real way, if you could help with that. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, I think part of it for me is really recognizing the fact that um, direct, like 
uh, we're not necessarily going to make a lot of friends doing direct action, right? <laughs> we may get a lot closer to the friends that we have that we're doing direct action with. Um, but I'm going to be really honest. Um, I've had someone come at me with a meat cleaver during an action, during a blockade. Um, and not saying that will happen to everybody. That was a very specific situation. Um, but yeah, if you're interrupting the status quo, <laughs> uh, the status quo is the status quo because a lot of people really like it um, or are just so complacent to it that they don't even notice it anymore. So yes, that's entirely unsettling and uncomfortable. And I think that goes back to the question about who is our audience, right? Um, so for instance, what was it, um, maybe a year or so ago, there was conversation about how, I think it was the Proud Boys or some, you know, uh, very conservative, we don't care group, um, was coming to Oakland, right? Um, I'm not trying to force a conversation with them. You know, I'm very clear that that's not someone who wants to be in conversation, is not trying to join my radical black queer movement. Um, that, that I'm not trying to force a conversation with them, but maybe I'm trying to force a conversation with the people at the bar who are um, drinking with them, who maybe can have a conversation with them. Uh, maybe I'm forcing a conversation with the people who own the bar. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know that um, direct action is necessarily going to win everybody to our side. Um, but I think part of the strategy is being real calculated about who can we win, who do we want to win, and how can that be accomplished? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And I think maybe just hearing examples as you continue and uh, might help me connect the dots as far as, you know, all these different elements, like who and the what and the how and all that. Totally, yeah, no worries. Yeah, and even, you know, I would say um, part of the motivation for the black brunches that we did was building morale amongst each other, you know, of just being tired of grieving in our homes by ourselves. Uh, and it was to, I think part of it was to build morale amongst ourselves. And, you know, uh, we did one black brunch in Walnut Creek. Did we believe that the like Bay Area city that housed houses the most Oakland police officers <laughs> was going to be hospitable to our message? Uh, not necessarily. Um, but we were, it was worth it to us and uh, whoever may be around um, to want to join and see our public displays of grief. Are there more questions? I have a little question. Um, I don't know if you guys going to call on people. Okay. Um, so the question is, because it's very, it's a very rich, very rich discussion. So I'm thinking about the um, freeways getting closed down. And I mean, my reaction not being there, but when I would read about them was, wow, those, you know, there's a lot of commitment there to that direct action. People are putting themselves up on the freeway in danger and also great risk of being arrested. I, I wasn't sure what con closing down the freeways had to do with that particular issue, but I was also interested in thinking about it. Um, but what I was, but I was also thinking about how you've got multiple reasons to do it, like the morale, but how great it would be if the people sitting in the traffic were also kind of like, at least attention was paid to something directly they could think about. And I know you can't like cover the miles of stopped cars. But I was wondering whether things like this came up, like whether either you had signs that said, you know, not everybody gets to go home to their families. The families have died. You know, someone has died in the family. Uh, spend a moment maybe grieving for them and appreciating what you have or something. Or if that conversation went out later, if you guys were ever interviewed on the news, why did you do this? If that message could kind of like go out for people to kind of go like, oh, Oh, that's why they were there. I was curious about how you guys handled that and if there were those opportunities. Yes, 
Absolutely. Um, I remember one of the black brunches we did on Valentine's Day and we had roses and we gave everyone roses and with a note about exactly why we were there because we were there for black love and we wanted all black people to know that they were loved. And that was very important to us. And then some of the actions, um, we've had next steps, right? So I think someone else was asking about what are we motivating them to do, right? So one had next steps such as alternatives to calling the police, right? Because it's our assumption that some people call the police because they don't know what else they're supposed to do, right? Um, and so giving people alternatives of have your neighbor's phone number, get to know the people around you, right? These are the tangible next steps to we're forcing this conversation of policing in our neighborhoods is not effective or equitable. And this is the next step in the conversation and how you can join that movement, right? And so I think that's, you know, part of what I want to emphasize and underscore is that we do the very best when we're able to effectively know who our audience is and therefore be able to create a message that is going to be effective with our audience. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Other questions? Awesome. All right. So I am going to move on to developing an action. Let me share my screen one more time. So here are some of the elements that we've already been discussing. Uh, do not worry about needing to take highly exhaustive notes. Um, this is gonna come to you after the call. So I'd much rather you use this time to think creatively and really metabolize the information um, than to need to write a lot down. Uh, so the first, and, and this is intended, I know these are listed, um, but the intention is for them to actually be cyclical. When I was taught this, it was a star. And the idea is that there is no beginning and that there is no end. There is no one of these that's more important than the other. And actually, I always like to emphasize that I have found this is a very important thing to go back to, say, a week before an action because you may start thinking through all of these things and then as things evolve and things emerge you realize that a week before you have come far away from who you originally thought your audience was going to be and that's okay but that may mean that you need to rethink certain components right and so i find this to be a very helpful thing to use throughout the process of planning a direct action um, as a way to make sure that we're being really strategic and effective. So um, one of the things is strategies and goals. What are we trying to achieve? This is my very favorite. Is it winnable? <laughs> um, because I have been involved in a great deal, many of actions where uh, what we were fighting for may not have actually been winnable, right? Um, and not to say that Ending capitalism isn't winnable because I wouldn't be doing any of the work that I do if I didn't believe ending capitalism wasn't winnable. Um, but you could put a, um, you know, a like timeline on the winnability. You know, <laughs> like, is it winnable within a year, two years, right? Um, and we'll get more into later uh, something that I call redefining success. But is it winnable within uh, a real realistic idea of what success could look like? How will this move us towards our goal? So I heard some people sort of uplifting that a little bit earlier um, of having seen actions, experienced actions where they may have supported the cause, uh, but we're really confused about how the action was pushing forward any type of agenda or goals, right? And so that's an, a very important part 
of the planning. We talked a little bit about messaging. How will we effectively communicate our goal, right? So we talked about what does it look like to pass out pamphlets about next steps. Um, props are wonderful, right? Um, people really love creativity. Um, so how can we think creativity, creatively about messaging? Um, sometimes you can do a banner drop, right? Maybe the action, you can have a whole action that's a banner drop, but you can also have um, drop a banner uh, in support of another direct action. But banner drops are a wonderful way to um, get across some messaging because especially if you can get a banner, say on the side of a building or somewhere um, very high, people can see it and it's highly visible and you can really create um, some effective messaging. Uh, someone else uplifted this. How will this come across to our allies, right? Um, and we may not care, but it's still an important question to ask. Um, how will this come across? Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, there's how will this come across to our allies and how will this come across to our opponents? So we may say, um, we don't really care about how those people that are eating their pancakes are going to feel. Uh, but I still think it's a very important thing to think about. Um, because you never know uh, to what extent those people can be won over to be allies. Um, how will this come across to our allies is a very important question. So um, I'd like to give the example of um, when we did a city council shutdown, there was in Oakland, there was a parcel of public land that was going to be sold off by the Oakland City Council at far, far, far below market rate. And um, most people didn't know about it. So we wanted to interrupt the city council meeting where they were planning on selling off this parcel of land. It was a great action. Still to this day, I think it was one of the best actions I've ever been a part of. However, what we didn't know, we didn't think about was checking the docket to see what was on the city council docket for the rest of the evening after we shut the city council meeting down because what we found out later was that further in the docket was um, a vote about allocation of resources to schools. And there had been a number of people who had come out not knowing about our shutdown to support um, the redistribution of funds to school. And it may have been that we would have decided to do that action anyway. I think we probably would have, but we still have to think through who are our allies in this struggle and how is what we're doing going to affect them. Um, messaging, what kind of signage will help us convey our message, right? So we talked about the possibility of a banner drop. You can do wheat pasting, but part of this comes from understanding who is your audience, how do they need to be communicated to, and also um, what language do they speak? And I don't mean just language in terms of um, actual languages, but like even dialects, what, how do they communicate about ideas? Um, what are the words that people would use to communicate about things? Um, and that comes from really, really understanding who is our audience. Uh, the next one is tone. This is very important. Um, I will say that uh, when we did the Black Brunches, we would always say our tone is grieving. Um, and then we would show up and we would be a whole bunch of radical black queer people and we couldn't pull off being grieving together for very long and it always turned very jubilant <laughs> um, which was wonderful right but our tone communicates a certain thing right and i i think it's fine for our tone to be um in spite of it all these black queer folks choose joy um but but they're a very different message to convey um, grief, somber, sacred, and I think it's really important to think about how the tone that we maintain throughout the direct action informs the message. Uh, timing. This is a very important one. They're all very important, but um, this is really important. We're going to come back to this in a second. Um, the question of do we have capacity? Uh, I have seen 
I think I'll say in this moment, probably the overwhelming majority of the harm and trauma that I've seen um, people experience in actions was because we didn't actually have the capacity. Um, we did a, um, a direct action about that same parcel of land that was in Oakland. And we're uh, ambitious people. We told ourselves that we were gonna shut down, um, I think it's a six way intersection right next to the parcel. And we decided that to shut down a six way intersection, you only needed to have one person in each lane of traffic. Um, and what yeah. happened was many people came very close to be hit, being hit by cars. That we didn't have the capacity to shut down that intersection. Or we could have built capacity. Um, but the idea that an single person could shut down a lane of traffic, in retrospect, uh, we were being way overly ambitious, um, which is OK. But we also like, really, really need to think about our capacity and then also um, our capacity around urgency. Um, far too often, I see folks just pushing and pushing and rushing way too fast. And especially um, as we get to those real critical moments before the action, um, my experience has been that far too often uh, folks are unable to say, we've come this far and we need to put it off. And the overwhelming majority of the actions I've seen or been a part of um, are long-term fights. Right? It's, not, it's not something such as if we don't get this legislation passed, um, it's going to have like these immediate ramifications on our community. Um, for example, you know, the fight for Black lives. Uh, unfortunately, I recognize that um, if we don't turn up right now in the next three weeks before the election, there's a strong likelihood um, that there will be once again be uprisings around Black lives, right? And so the question is um, around urgency. Sometimes does this really have to be right now? Um, and that's part of the timing question. Um, and also, you know, what's going on in the city? What's going on in people's lives? When we think about our audience, um, is this the right time for the people that we're really trying to be in conversation with? Uh, will this lead to greater excitement and involvement or greater burnout and contention? <laughs> Such a good question. Uh, and you can't always anticipate it, but it is a very important conversation to have. Um, I just uplifted a second ago a little bit about what is the political climate. Very important to understand, um, not just uh, in terms of the city, the nation, who you're targeting, um, but what is the political climate for your community? Um, and then is there a day, a meeting, an anniversary, something you can commemorate? Direct actions are really good um, as commemorations. Um, but once again, while assessing your capacity and not attempting to be overly urgent. Are there any questions yet? We're about halfway through. Nice. All right. Um, audience, we talked about this. So who are we attempting to communicate with and persuade? Who are they? What are their values? How is our message effectively communicated to this population? So we talked about that um, a little bit before. Really, really, really knowing your audience. If you are not a member of the audience or the community you're attempting to be in conversation with, really talking to people who are part of that community. I think a lot of times that's where the messaging breakdown comes, is we think um, that our audience thinks a certain way and we can be in conversation with them um, and we really have no idea, right? And so I think um, really thinking about how our audience communicates um, and what will really motivate them is really powerful. Allies, how may our allies want to support or be involved? Um, a lot of times it's really easy for us, or I've experienced, um, you know, if people aren't 
trying to get arrested tomorrow and scale the side of a building, then we don't even really think about them. Um, but you can have all types of roles. There may be people who um, are allies in support of your action and they want to come pray over people. They want to bring food. They want to send care packages after. Um, they want to uh, bring water to the folks that are part of the direct action, right? So really thinking about who can we partner with? Who are our allies? Who are the people who would support the movement that we're part of and maybe not participate in the direct action? Um, resources. What is it going to take to pull this off? Too often, and we'll get, um, we'll get to this in the self-care portion, but too often we think about what is this going to take to pull it off in terms of how much money will we need for bail funds? Um, what props do we need? Um, too often we don't think about ourselves as resources, right? And so um, what is it going to take from me to pull this action off? What is it going to take from my community? Um, and really thinking about that as um, Often we have um, communities with very finite resources. So is this worth the very finite resources that are available to my community? Um, is the goal worth our resources, right? Um, and is it possible to do this in a more resourceful way? Lastly, but certainly not leastly, is the target and um, we talked about this a little bit before too, um, in terms of our audience. Who, where can we find our audience, right? Um, for example, we were saying, um, you know, if my goal is to build morale amongst Black folks about um, Black death and the movement for Black lives, well, where, where are Black people? If I don't know, I'm going to have to figure it out. Um, where, when and where will they be able to hear our message, right? So if I decide, well, and I don't think this is true, but let's just say, if I decide, well, I think the majority of Black people in the Bay Area are getting on BART at 7 a.m. And I decide to do an action at BART at 7 a.m., well, guess what? That may indeed be where most Black folks in Oakland are, that's not going to be the best time to reach them, right? That's going to be a time people are probably on their way to work. So really thinking about where are folks, but also when and where are they going to be most able to hear our message? And maybe when, are they, when and where are they going to be most able to support us and maybe even join the action? And where do we find the status quo to upset it? Right, so I gave the example of the um, Oakland City Council meeting. That's where we found the status quo to upset it. Uh, <laughs> the mayor's house, <laughs> that's where we found the status quo <laughs> and moved forward with upsetting it. Um, and so uh, I think those are all really important questions. And like I said, the intention of this is for it to be a cyclical process, um, that it's something we're constantly living with and um, continually re-engaging. Are there any questions yet? Sweet. Um, well, what I would like to do now is spend about the next 20 minutes um, having you do small groups. And I would love for you to use these resources, um, especially the ones that we just went over around planning a direct action to get into small groups and think about um, how you can use these to come together to mock plan a direct action. What I will say before we send you to small groups is please remember that this is being recorded and nothing said on Zoom is private. So uh, conduct yourselves accordingly. Uh, but I would like um, you to all just get a shot at sort of using these and seeing how that feels. And then the last thing I'm going to say before you go into small groups is to talk about the cities that you're in if you're not all the same in the same cities. 
So something I find uh, to be really important about planning a direct action is thinking about how you can leverage the political climate of the city that you're in. And what I mean by that is when we were doing a lot of our direct actions in Oakland, it was recently after Oakland had paid out some astronomical amount of money for folks that had been harmed protesting during Occupy Oakland. And so we knew that the political climate in Oakland was probably that we could escalate things pretty significantly, like shut down a city council meeting um, and maybe uh, things would go okay. Or, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily going to be as escalated as it was in some other cities that didn't have quite the same neoliberal government that Oakland does. Um, but I've taught this training in Detroit and the folks in Detroit were like, yeah, nah, <laughs> we're not gonna shut down the city council meeting. That's uh, gonna be over before it starts. But what folks in Detroit do have, um, as some of you may know, is a ton of space. There's so many abandoned buildings in Detroit. So then it's like, well, how can we utilize this? Um, could we take over a building and turn it into a clinic? Um, could we, how do we utilize um, this overabundance of space? Um, and so I think it's really good to think about how um, different actions or different types of actions may make sense in different contexts. I hope that makes sense. Does anyone have any questions about what I'd like you to do in the small groups before we get to it? Excellent. And just a couple of announcements. Just so everyone knows, we're, we're not going to be recording this, the small groups. Um, and Zoom is still not the most secure thing, so just know that. And uh, the recording of the call will be uh, mailed to, or emailed to everyone. It'll take us a few days to edit it, but it will go out to everyone. All right, so if there's no more questions, um, we will put you into small groups. Uh, and give me a, uh, if you end up in a small group with just like one or two people, I may adjust that. So just give it a few seconds once you're in your small groups um, and we will see you back in 20 minutes. All right. Awesome. So um, originally I had planned for us to have some question and answer time now to talk about what that had been like for folks, but we are up against a time crunch. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to talk fairly quickly through some of the other things that I plan for us to discuss and then um, my, if you wouldn't mind saving uh, your questions, concerns, comments from the small group um, for the very end, I'd be so appreciative. Um, so we just have a little bit under 20 minutes left. Um, and I want to make sure that we make time to talk about some of the possible roles for an action. Um, and then also to talk through community care and self-care. So um, let me share my screen. Everyone can see this? Yeah, awesome. Um, so one thing that we really want um, when we have actions is the very worst, well, not the worst, but a not great thing that can happen a lot of lack of clarity about whose role it is to do what, and then it very easily breaks down into a lot of um, disagreement and dissension. And because so often when we do direct actions, it's impossible to predict everything that can happen, decisions need to be made very quickly. And a lot of times the very best way to do that is to have a lot of clarity around whose role is what. So as I said, we don't have a ton of time. So I'm gonna talk through these very quickly. Uh, and maybe that will help flesh out some of the um, questions around messaging and audience and how that gets disseminated. And then just a reminder that this is gonna come uh, in the follow-up notes. 
So don't worry about it too much. I think the notes will be fairly self-explanatory and I'll make sure you have my contact information as well. So if questions emerge while you're utilizing any resources, um, I can be available to you. So uh, most importantly, do not ever plan any type of action without the National Lawyers Guild or trained legal observers. If mm -hmm. I could have the National Lawyers Guild follow me through life, I would. <laughs> They're a wonderful resource. <laughs> um, so if you don't know about them, please make sure um, you find out about them. They will send legal observers for free um, that are highly edited in my idea. Very important to have an action coordinator, right? Um, there, is like there, there's a chance that there could be decisions that need to be made on the fly. You don't want to have a conversation on the fly about whose job it is. Um, so it needs to be someone who's trusted by the entire group to make a decision for the client. Um, there was another one that I thought was the very most uh, important. Those are the two most important. And then I'll say, um, on top of that, de-escalators, this was always my role. I, whatever makeup is in my DNA, um, I'm very good at calling people down. Um, I am never the police liaison because um, of my own personal triggers. Uh, I know that talking to the police is not my role. And so, no, your your sound is breaking up a little bit, but we can still hear like ninety five percent of what you're saying. But I think let me try and move closer to my modem. Yeah. And then let me know if it doesn't get any better. Um. Okay, so I was saying um, very important to have de-escalators and if you think there's going to be any type of police presence or, you know, maybe if you're unsure, um, folks whose job it is to talk to the police when they come, um, very important. Uh, I have a friend who I, I don't know what happened in her life or her experience or her makeup, but she might she was able to convince the police that they almost wanted to join our actions. <laughs> Some people are just good at things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, so I also just want to highlight that uh, we're not all people that want to be on the bullhorn, need to be on the bullhorn. Some of us are. Some of us are good at talking to the police. Some of us are um, good at messaging, right? And this is the place where you can live into uh, what you think your skill set could best serve. Uh, optional roles, maybe a liaison, right? People may show up and ask, um, like from the press, and ask, what is this about? Very good idea to have people already chosen. Um, so there's no debate about that on the fly. Uh, medics, if you think there may be some reason to need medics, jail support, um, community care can be people who bring um, all types of snack, food, um, just make sure that everybody's doing okay. Social media is a really good role for people who, for whatever reason, cannot be present at the action, but amplifying it on social media uh, is a really great role. So um, I know we're moving past this really quickly, but this is just an idea of um, some really important roles that you have as part of your action. So um, lastly, but very importantly, uh, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, um, community care and redefining success. So community care, a lot of times, you know, we have this um, culture where people are talking all the time about self-care. And self-care is really important. I don't want to say it's not. But a lot of times what I experience in movement community is um, we're all in community. We plan these actions together. We participate in the action together, and then we say to each other, each other okay, now go home and take care of yourself, right? Um, and that can be a really isolating experience. And also, when I study a lot of um, more indigenous movements or the historical trajectory of movements, more often we actually feel in community. So I really like to uplift the idea of community care and also including so you're still like breaking what, up a little bit. Huh. Yeah, not sure. I don't know what I can do. I'm sitting most like of right what you're next saying? to Okay. Yeah. We'll just
Keep going. All right. Maybe I'll try and talk slowly. Um, but yes, I'm just saying, uh, I think it's really important, especially in our movements, to uplift this idea of what does it look like to care for each other as part of the movement. Um, and I think part of that is about redefining success. We talked a little bit about that in the beginning in terms of um, urgency, but also what is our strategy and our goal. And so I like to call this redefining success as the idea of um, sort of flipping on its head this idea that success is if we shut the building down, if we change the policy, if we um, get a certain thing enacted, and really what I like to uplift in my own personal work is my definition of success is how well did we work together. Um, capitalism, one of the, uh, to me, one of the biggest functions of capitalism is keeping us very separate, isolated, and focused on ourselves. And so for me, um, if my definition of success is how well did we work together, I'm living into this new world, I'm living into this new idea of success, and I'm living it daily in the actions that I'm planning. Um, so those are very important ways of, for me of sort of reframing the ways that we do um, healing and care for one another in movement culture. Um, sorry I had to move through that last part so quickly, but I wanna make sure we leave time for questions. So um, Kazu, do we have any questions? Not yet, but if you're opening up um, yeah, I want to encourage people to either use the raise hand feature or put it into the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And then also, um, if you'd like to share what the small group experience was like, or if anything came up in actually trying to engage these resources. We'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then we'll transition into sharing a little bit about some of the actions that are coming up around the elections and how people can plug in. So there's a question from Iris. Is there a direct action already in process that we can join regarding the election? So I can share a little bit about that later, but Zan, I don't know if you, if you want to share about that as well. No. Um, I, yeah, I think your updates will be more informative. So yeah, we'll get to that question, Iris, in, in about 10 minutes here. Well, I think um, while you guys maybe are thinking about posing your question, what I'd like to uplift is really just doing your best to think creatively about these things. I know these are very nuts and bolts. They seem a little cut and dry, but I really encourage you to take them and grapple with them and think creatively about it. Um, while you were in your small groups, I was thinking about one of the best direct or one of my favorite direct actions I've ever heard about was um, two New York Panthers uh, in the maybe early 80s, 70s, 80s, um, went into the stock exchange and they had a fistful of fake money and they threw it out over the stock exchange and the stockbrokers actually spent so much time beating each other to get the fake money that they had to shut down the stock exchange. Um, and that was two people, right? Um, using their ability to make things entirely unworkable. So I just use that as a way of highlighting that uh, we can get very creative. <laughs> sure. There's two questions in the chat. One is uh, from Andrea. I would like to know your answers to your boss's question about what good did it uh, holding him up for four hours uh, in traffic. And then another one, how do you negotiate working with opponents and countering the comments that you might get from people about uh, being a traitor, especially negotiating with police and things like that? And then there's another question from Courtney as well, but why don't we take those two? Mm -hmm. uh, the first question was, how do I answer my boss's question? Um, I think it was twofold. Was that it? Um, I think it's twofold. One was to say, um, part of our goal is visibility and making things unworkable. So we created a lot of visibility. Uh, we got a lot of media coverage. Uh, we did create that. We did do that in creating visibility. Um, and we also made things entirely unworkable. 
But what I also had to say is we didn't do a good job with our messaging. Um, if you could not understand um, at the end of the day what our goal, that that was our goal, then perhaps we didn't do that good with our messaging. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a both and. I hope that answers your question. And then the other one, what was that? Can you repeat the other one, please? Around how you negotiate uh, how you negotiate uh, at times like working with uh, your so-called opponents and, and countering the, the comments about you being a traitor? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I want to, I guess the first thing I want to say is just because we talk to the police doesn't necessarily mean that we're working with them. Right. Um, I was the action coordinator when we shut down the Oakland City Council. And so it was my job to talk with Lynette McElhaney, who is the council president. And um, I, I certainly wasn't negotiating with her. Uh, she wanted me to get everyone to leave. And I was like, oh, of course, I would have them leave. But these people, you know, they're just like dead set on staying, right? So sometimes it's actually just being in conversation with people can de-escalate the situation. So it's not necessarily that we're negotiating um, so much as doing some strategic de-escalation. And the same is true with the cops. Um, a lot of times, yes, Carol Fife for this District 3. I live in District 3. I support that message. <laughs> um, and yeah, sometimes it's really just about uh, how do we interact with these systems in a way that can keep us safe and de-escalate the situation. Um, so I hope that, and you know, honestly, um, I've been a part of a lot of actions and been called a lot of things. Um, and part of it is really just about knowing our own triggers Part of choosing our roles is knowing our own triggers and what's going to be particularly upsetting to us. So when I said I'm never the police liaison, I'm never the police liaison because I know the way that my triggers are set up is that um, I'm not going to keep anyone safe by anything that I have to say to the police. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's about knowing that you don't need to have an outward facing role. Um, but the truth is, um, that's where a lot of the trauma comes in for a lot of us who do direct action is um, direct confrontation. And I think that's something uh, we really need to think about when we plan these actions and we choose how we're gonna show up in them is um, when we talk about that, what is the effect that this is gonna have on me and that I'm a resource? Um, I think that's part of the question is, um, how is this confrontation? How am I going to experience this confrontation? Um, so there's another question from uh, Courtney Alex uh, saying, uh, wondering about how to get connected with the larger campaign seems important to be connected and in, in community. And then another comment um, from Courtney Alex also in the small groups that are talking about how to use and even target social media in direct action. So any thoughts on how to stay connected to the broader movement and role of social media. Mm -hmm. Staying connected to the broader movement. I really think it's just about relationship building. A lot of movement is really about relationship building um, and really good um, old school organizing. And so I think that's a really good way of staying connected to the larger movement and really locating yourself um, within which movement am I a part of. Um, and how do I stay connected to that? Um, what was the other one? Uh, role of social media, about how to use social media or even targeting social media companies for direct action. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, targeting social media companies. Uh, yes, especially those of us who live in the Bay Area. Yes, those of us that live in the Bay Area that have extraordinarily high rents because of the social media companies. Um, yes to all of that. And it's challenging, right? Um, because I think uh, the challenge with social media is that we engage them culturally as if they're community commons when actually they're private for profit corporations. 
Um, and so part of it is really, to me, constantly staying mindful of the fact that they're private for-profit corporations um, and how do we leverage that for our use. Um, so some of that is about how do we expand from our messaging um, and thinking about our audience and how will that translate onto social media? So I know that's not really an exhaustive answer, but part of it is about um, if you have chants that you're using as part of the action, how, do those how would those chants potentially translate onto social media? Um, and once again, rethinking about your audience. Where is your audience on social media? Are they in specific groups? Are they using specific hashtags? Um, what language do they speak on social media? What platforms do they use on social media? Some audiences are Tumblr folks. Some audiences are Snapchat folks, right? Um, so thinking about all of those different things. And I also just want to um, share a, a resource for folks that may not be familiar with it. Uh, Jean Sharp, who passed away a couple years ago, uh, wrote a book years ago called The Politics of Nonviolent Action. And it's actually three books. And the second book is um, a list of 198 methods of direct action. And the 198 methods is available, like if you just Google 198 methods of direct action, it's available, but there's a whole book that really goes into detail on all of them. So I think, you know, um, people throughout this call have talked about like creativity in direct action. And sometimes we hear the words direct action and we think it has to look a certain way, but there's just so much diversity within direct action. So I really wanna encourage that as a resource as well. Um, so I wanna share my screen and, and talk a little bit about some of the actions that are happening here before I pass it back to Zan for our closing. So let me just share my screen real quick. So I think most people, uh, or some of you may be aware that um, at least in the Bay Area, um, well, we've been organizing a bunch of trainings here at East Point Peace Academy um, since the beginning of October. And this is a, a season that we've been calling Preparing Together. And this training today led by Zan is part of that kind of Preparing Together series. Um, we have a couple more trainings coming up uh, we have a song leading workshop tomorrow um, with some of the members from the Peace Poets. And then Sunday morning is going to be an in-person training in Richmond, California, for those of you that are in the Bay around uh, painting street murals. Um, and then we even have a couple more trainings throughout the, the, the next uh, section of the, the season of deepening together um, around emotional regulation tools and things like that. So you can check out eastpointpeace.org for a list of trainings. And then from starting Sunday afternoon, we're entering the season of deepening together, which is um, 10 consecutive days of gatherings in Oakland with each different each day having a different theme. So we're gonna be starting with a day of remembrance and ancestry with an ancestry ritual on Sunday afternoon, and then a day of um, relationship, a day of grief, a day of joy, and so on and so forth. So. Um, this is an opportunity, like a lot of uh, organizations that are thinking about actions and mobilizations after the elections are only thinking about November 4th and afterwards, but so often the success of direct action depends largely on how much work we've done before the action, right, to prepare ourselves, to deepen in relationship, to ground ourselves. And so we're going to be spending 10 days really deepening and grounding together. Um, so if you're in the Bay Area, please check it out. Some of those events are going to be, or there'll be virtual components as well. And we're trying to put those together and we'll be updating the website as that comes together. And then uh, starting November 4th, the day after the election is the season of taking action together. And part of the challenge is that, you know, we still don't know what we're going to be responding to. Right? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I've been joking around for the last three days or so that like I've never worked so hard to organize things that I hope we don't have to do. Like there's a lot of organizing happening to try to stop the coup. And it's possible that the coup doesn't happen because Biden wins in a landslide, which means we'll have to continue to organize in a different way um, because there's still we're still in a crisis regardless, um, is, is my opinion. But um, there's not a lot of details on what those actions look like, but here's a few things that I can say. Um, we're partnering with an organization called Choose Democracy. I've been doing some of their trainings, and if you haven't taken their trainings, I recommend that. 
Um, it's kind of the big picture framework of how some people around the country are organizing. And their uh, process is to make sure that everyone who can go out and vote, right? The best way to stop a coup from happening is to prevent it. Um, so it's important for everyone to vote. And then to refuse to accept the election results until every vote is counted. And Choose Democracy has a whole kind of campaign idea about getting public officials to make a public statement that they're going to make sure that that's the case. And then if something happens and the current administration tries to steal the election in some way to commit to nonviolently taking to the streets and if necessary escalating to a point where we, can, we have to shut down the entire country to protect the integrity of the vote. Um, one of the things that we are planning on is October 29th um, in Oakland, uh, we're going to be shutting down 14th Street between Broadway and Washington and painting a massive mural that says the words choose democracy. And then above and below the, the, the big block letters, there's going to be at least 12 different community organizations that are going to be doing these, these murals that are um, like a circle of the vision of uh, what they believe democracy could look like, real democracy. So we're gonna be out for three hours. Um, we need lots of hands to help paint the mural, um, as well as if you are willing to do some blockades, the blockades are gonna be led by a group of grandmas. So if the police want to arrest us, they're gonna have to get through the grandmas, um, which is awesome. Uh, but the grandmas will need support. And so if you're willing to do, it'll be a pretty low risk action. Um, people have done these kinds of uh, street blockades and mural paintings before, and there's never been an arrest. So if you want to kind of like get your direct action chops on and, and help out with the blockade or help with the, uh, the painting of the street mural, please come through um, 3 to 6 p.m. on Thursday the 29th. All the information is on our website. And this is a rehearsal for a much larger version of the same action that we're envisioning happening in downtown San Francisco in the financial district if there's a coup attempt. If there's a coup attempt, we'll send out notices and we're gonna be doing mass blockades throughout San Francisco to do a mural that's maybe two or three times as large while at the same time simultaneously shutting down banks and financial institutions, a lot of the corporations that are responsible for the mess that we are in. Um, and also on November 4th, there's an organization called Bay Resistance um, that's local and a national organization called Protect the Results that is calling for a national mobilization all over the country on November 4th. So if you're in Oakland, that's happening at Frank Ogawa Oscar Grant Plaza on noon, regardless of the result. If you're in San Francisco, it's happening at 5 p.m. at Civic Center Plaza. If you go to protect the, uh, protecttheresults.org, you can search for wherever you are in the country to find uh, events that are happening near you. And, you know, we need people to be in teams as much as possible. Direct action happens like it, it, it's, it's most effective when people are in teams and affinity groups so that you're not one of a thousand people, but you're one of seven people and you're protecting each other. You're looking out for each other. You've done some planning together. And so we really highly, highly want to encourage you if you're not already in small teams to try to call three, four, five of your friends and say, hey, can we commit to taking action together? On November 4th, can we agree that we're gonna, whatever happens, we're gonna do it together? Because one of the biggest um, factors of, that, that prevents people from engaging in direct action is because it's scary to do it alone. But if you're a part of a team that gives you a lot more resources, and so in the follow-up email that you'll receive tonight, um, you'll be getting some links to, uh, if you go to eastpointpeace.org backslash teams, and you'll get the link in the email, You'll, there's a handout of some practices that you can start to do in your teams to prepare for action. And then there's also a link that you'll receive in your email that's eastpointpeace.org backslash November teams. And if you are in a team and you're in the Bay Area, there, it's a survey that you can fill out. And once you fill out that survey, you will know that you're in a team so that we can send you action um, updates and things like that. Um, and uh, yes. There's definitely um, understandably concerns around COVID. Um, 
there, there was just recently a study that was put out around some of the Black Lives Matter uprisings of, 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 this, uh, of this year, showing that like those events didn't end up being super spreader events in the way that we were afraid that it might. So it, it seems like outdoor gatherings, as long as they're outdoor, as long as there's some awareness of social distancing aren't as dangerous. And at the same time, it's still a concern that we are definitely aware of. So all of the days of deepening will be social distance, masks. There'll be lots of hand sanitizer and masks being given, up, given out as well. Um, and we're also trying to figure out uh, virtual actions that people can take part in as well. So all of those resources, again, will be in your follow-up email. Um, and yes, it's the Thousand Grandmothers Bay Area who are uh, helping us with the, with the shutdowns. Um, and if you want to, again, connect with any of that, uh, all of the information will be in the follow-up email. So want to thank all of you for sitting uh, with us for these two hours. I want to hand it over to Zan for any closing words. And then after that, I'm just going to invite everyone to uh, come off of mute and, and shower Zan with your appreciation. So Zan, I'll hand it back to you. You're muted, Zan. As good as we get at these things, we never get it every time. <laughs> um, but just thank you to everybody for sharing space with me tonight. Um, really grateful. And I know when, like, as I've been through some of these trainings, sometimes when you're not actually in the midst of doing the work of planning the action, it can feel um, like it doesn't completely make sense. But I invite you to just like hold it, hold on to the resources when you get the email with some of the information. Um, it may become more relevant later. And just um, remember to keep hope um, and continue cooperating with each other and be creative with everything that you've learned tonight and just really grateful. And my contact information will be in the email as well. So um, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me um, as you're working with any of these materials. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zan, for your wisdom tonight. So I just want to invite everyone to unmute yourself and it'll all be kind of messy, but let's all shout out. <laughs> Thank, we'll Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. So, what did Sam say about people staying around afterwards? Was what was that? Or, did you say something about that, Sam? Thank you. I don't think so. So yeah, okay. we'll close the meeting for tonight. Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night. <laughs>
accept the election results until every vote is counted. And Choose Democracy has a whole kind of campaign idea about getting public officials to make a public statement that they're going to make sure that that's the case. And then if something happens and the current administration tries to steal the election in some way to commit to nonviolently taking to the streets, and if necessary, escalating to a point where we, can, we have to shut down the entire country to protect the integrity of the vote. Um, one of the things that we are planning on is October 29th um, in Oakland, uh, we're gonna be shutting down 14th Street between Broadway and Washington and painting a massive mural that says the words choose democracy. And then above and below the, the, the big block letters, there's gonna be at least 12 different community organizations that are gonna be doing these, these murals that are um, like a circle of the vision of uh, what they believe democracy could look like, real democracy. So we're gonna be out for three hours. Um, we need lots of hands to help paint the mural. Um, as well as if you are willing to do some blockades, the blockades are gonna be led by a group of grandmas. So if the police want to arrest us, they're gonna have to get through the grandmas, um, which is awesome. Uh, but the grandmas will need support. And so if you're willing to do, it'll be a pretty low risk action. Um, people have done these kinds of uh, street blockades and mural paintings before, and there's never been an arrest. So if you wanna kind of like get your direct action chops on and, and help out with the blockade, or help with the, uh, the painting of the street mural, please come through um, 3 to 6 p.m. on Thursday the 29th. All the information is on our website. And this is a rehearsal for a much larger version of the same action that we're envisioning happening in downtown San Francisco in the financial district if there's a coup attempt. If there's a coup attempt, we'll send out notices and we're gonna be doing mass blockade throughout San Francisco to do a mural that's maybe two or three times as large, while at the same time simultaneously shutting down banks and financial institutions, a lot of the corporations that are responsible for the mess that we are in. Um, and also on November 4th, there's an organization called Bay Resistance um, that's local and a national organization called Protect the Results that is calling for a national mobilization all over the country on November 4th. So if you're in Oakland, that's happening at Frank Ogawa Oscar Grant Plaza on noon, regardless of the result. If you're in San Francisco, it's happening at 5 p.m. at Civic Center Plaza. If you go to protect the, uh, protecttheresults.org, you can search for wherever you are in the country to find uh, events that are happening near you. And, you know, we need people to be in teams as much as possible. Direct action happens like it, it, it's, it's most effective when people are in teams and affinity groups so that you're not one of a thousand people, but you're one of seven people and you're protecting each other. You're looking out for each other. You've done some planning together. And so we really highly, highly want to encourage you if you're not already in small teams to try to call three, four, five of your friends and say, hey, can we commit to taking action together? On November 4th, can we agree that we're gonna, whatever happens, we're gonna do it together? Because one of the biggest um, factors of, that, that prevents people from engaging in direct action is because it's scary to do it alone. But if you're a part of a team that gives you a lot more resources, and so in the follow-up email that you'll receive tonight, um, you'll be getting some links to, uh, if you go to eastpointpeace.org backslash teams, and you'll get the link in the email, You'll, there's a handout of some practices that you can start to do in your teams to prepare for action. And then there's also a link that you'll receive in your email that's eastpointpeace.org backslash November teams. And if you are in a team and you're in the Bay Area, there, it's a survey that you can fill out. And once you fill out that survey, you will know that you're in a team so that we can send you action um, updates and things like that. Um, and uh, yes. There is definitely, um, understandably, concerns around COVID. Um, there, there was just recently a study that was put out around some of the Black Lives Matter uprisings of, 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 this, uh, of this year, showing that like, those events didn't end up being super spreader events in the way that we were afraid that it might. So it, it seems like outdoor gatherings, as long as they're outdoor, as long as there's some awareness of social distancing, aren't as dangerous. 
And at the same time, it's still a concern that we are definitely aware of. So all of the days of deepening will be social distance, masks. There'll be lots of hand sanitizer and masks being given, up, given out as well. Um, and we're also trying to figure out uh, virtual actions that people can take part in as well. So all of those resources, again, will be in your follow-up email. Um, and yes, it's the Thousand Grandmothers Bay Area who are uh, helping us with the, with the shutdowns. Um, and if you want to, again, connect with any of that, uh, all of the information will be in the follow-up email. So want to thank all of you for sitting uh, with us for these two hours. I want to hand it over to Zan for any closing words. And then after that, I'm just going to invite everyone to uh, come off of mute and, and shower Zan with your appreciation. So Zan, I'll hand it back to you. You're muted, Zen. As good as we get at these things, we, we never get it every time. <laughs> um, but just thank you to everybody for sharing space with me tonight. Um, really grateful. And I know when, like, as I've been through some of these trainings, sometimes when you're not actually in the midst of doing the work of planning the action, it can feel um, like it doesn't completely make sense. But I invite you to just like hold it, hold on to the resources when you get the email with some of the information. Um, it may become more relevant later. And just um, remember to keep hope um, and continue cooperating with each other and be creative with everything that you've learned tonight and just really grateful. And my contact information will be in the email as well. So um, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me um, as you're working with any of these materials. Awesome, thank you so much, Zan, for your wisdom tonight. So I just wanna invite everyone to unmute yourself and it'll all be kind of messy, but let's all shout out. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. And we'll thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. So, what did Sam say about people staying around afterwards? Was what was that? Or, did you say something about that, Sam? Thank you. I don't think so. So yeah, okay. we'll close the meeting for tonight. Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night. <laughs> uh,